What if I told you that the secrets of our future, our fate, may be found in the work of Leonardo da Vinci? Born in 1452, da Vinci was the ultimate Renaissance man. Artist, botanist, architect, scientist, mathematician, writer, musician, you name it, da Vinci did it. And he did it at a level that boggles the mind. An inventor, da Vinci accurately predicted hundreds of advancements in science, transportation, medicine, and warfare 500 years before they happened. Some call that human genius, but a few think he actually saw the future. And many now believe that da Vinci's most dangerous prophecy has yet to be unlocked. Now, a newly discovered da Vinci drawing that's been hidden for centuries may prove to be the final piece to da Vinci's most important prophecy. It is time to decode Leonardo da Vinci. I'm Brad Meltzer. I've spent my life collecting stories, signs, symbols, and codes hidden in plain sight. Some have become the basis for my novels, but I've only scratched the surface. And now history has given me the resources to investigate the rest. This is Decoded. Hey, Brad, you got a good one for us? I do. You guys are going to Italy, and you're going to be decoding none other than Leonardo da Vinci himself. Oh, wow. OK, that is sweet, but uh, a little daunting. What's left about Leonardo? There are things happening right now that could change the way we think about da Vinci's work. There's a family in Genoa who thinks that they found a brand new da Vinci sketch. Oh, that would be huge. It was actually hidden for years in the secret compartment of a book, which is an awesome hiding place. And some people even think that it contained prophecies. Da Vinci's like Einstein to me, where if, there, if, if there's something that I haven't read of his, I want to get my hands on it. You ever see his drawings of helicopters and tanks and all the other inventions that didn't exist back then? Those are common knowledge. But he also had some more cryptic writings that some think are starting to come true. Oh, really? This is a real chance for us right on the front lines. Look into the sketch, let's see if it's real, and let's find out what da Vinci was trying to tell us about the future. Da Vinci sketch? I can't even imagine. I hope it is. Leonardo da Vinci is considered by many scholars to be the greatest painter of all time, producing both the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. Born out of wedlock in 1452 to a wealthy notary father and a peasant mother, da Vinci took his first painting apprenticeship with the Renaissance master Verrocchio when he was just 14 years old. The story goes that one of his first big opportunities was to paint an angel in the great master's work, Baptism of Christ. After looking at it, Verrocchio allegedly vowed that he would never paint again, unable to live up to his young student Leonardo. But da Vinci was also a brilliant draftsman, and his inventive drawings are proof of a thinker who was clearly centuries ahead of his time. He imagined a tank, scuba suits, driving machines. Look, for example, at his design for a flying machine. He drew this in 1488, more than 400 years before the Wright brothers. And his ornithopter flying device inspired the wing look when Bill Finger and Bob Kane created Batman. That is true. Without Leonardo, there is no Batman. Well, this is the cover, and this is the first page. This first page was stuck here. And the drawing was found exactly here, so. But this isn't a replica. This is the book. No, no, this is the book. This okay, is the original be... one. This is course. the original one that the cardinal had hidden the page inside. The, yes, the page. between the cover and the first page, yes. Cardinal Tadini, the former Archbishop of Genoa, hid the drawing in an unmarked book's secret compartment. And it remained there until his death in 1847. 
When the Cardinals possessions were auctioned off, a new owner noticed that the cover had been compromised and discovered the portrait underneath. It was another 50 years before anybody realized what an important discovery had been made. The drawing hung unassumingly on a wall until it caught the eye of Christina Gerbino's family friend, an antique restorer who decided to trace the drawing back to its creator. And that's when things got interesting. Art historians and forensic scientists concluded that not only was the drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, but it was from a collection of his works, the Codex Atlanticus, that includes apocalyptic prophecies. On the sketch, there was a signature that has been erased. Uh, there are uh, different hollows there in a totally dark ambient and using light uh, uh, from the left angle you can see the traces of the signature. This is a picture of the lower part of our drawing. So if we read the signature from the left side to the right side, uh, we have two letters that are uh, very clear. E-O is uh, myself in Italian. Then we have uh, four letters together, N-A-R-D, Nard. Then we have O-D-A, Io Nardo da Vinci. Use myself, Leo Nardo da Vinci. It's a signature. And then we can read the signature from the right side to the left side. And our uh, interpretation is It's Nevado Duran Oi. If we translate that in English, it means in this way I do myself. The fact that the signature reads backwards is a telltale sign that we're likely looking at a real da Vinci. He wrote almost all of his personal notes and letters in mirror writing. Some say it was because he was a southpaw and he simply didn't want to smudge the ink. Others say it was so that lesser artists wouldn't copy his masterworks. But many believe it was to hide ideas that might have gotten him in trouble with the government, the law, or the church. In Leonardo's time, dissecting anything more than a pig was strictly forbidden. But da Vinci performed clandestine dissections of humans and created highly detailed anatomical diagrams and writings, all in mirror writing. So when you read da Vinci's signature backwards, you get something interesting. Translated loosely, it becomes, in this way, I am doing this myself. It doesn't sound too provocative, but keep in mind, this was the 1400s. This is a time when self-reliance and putting human reason first were considered a threat to the church. The church always was supposed to come first, and humans were just its obedient servants. So between chopping up human corpses and the idea that the human body might be a marvel of science and not God, those were two things that may have put da Vinci on a short list of people to keep a close, watchful, and potentially suppressive eye on. Here we have the original drawing. This is the original drawing? This is the original drawing. I don't want to touch. Oh my God. Okay, well, we just have to look. We don't want to okay. touch. Okay. Oh. Wow. wow. Yes. Did you ever think in a million years that you would be this close to a Leonardo da Vinci sketch? How about this? To a found Leonardo da Vinci sketch. That's what's interesting. Do you believe that we are looking at a self-portrait of Leonardo da Vinci? Of course, I am sure about it. Really? Yeah. After some years, they started working, and one of the most important results was the discovery of the microchemical composition of our drawing that perfectly matches the composition of the paper of other three drawings attributed to Leonardo da Vinci. It's the same paper used for known da Vinci works. This is the same paper. Yes, exactly. We find out that uh, um, on the back of our drawing, uh, there are evident traces of glue, and uh, the same traces of glue are in the page 1033 of the Codex Atlanticus. To explain the Codex Atlanticus, first you gotta know what a codex is. It's a collection of ancient works. The Codex Atlanticus is essentially da Vinci's brain on paper, bringing together his personal journals, sketches, philosophies, and inventions. Let me put into perspective how important this book is. 
A smaller collection of da Vinci's scientific observations called the Codex Lester was purchased in 1994 for $30 million. The buyer was Bill Gates. The Codex Lester shows us da Vinci's understanding of the world was hundreds of years ahead of his time. But the Atlanticus shows us da Vinci's understanding of the world may have been hundreds of years ahead of our time. Da Vinci predicted so much of the world we live in today. Figuring out exactly what else he predicted may tell us what kind of future we can look forward to. Is there anything in that particular page, um, content-wise or thematically, that makes it special? Yes, that's curious because that page tells about uh, prophecies. That same page that was removed by the yeah, Cardinal? Yeah, page 1033. Has prophecies on it? Yes. Yes. And it's the only one in the entire Codex it's Atlanticus the page, that yes. does talk about prophecies. Yes, exactly. This is why this drawing matters. Many people believe page 1033 of the Codex Atlanticus is da Vinci trying to tell the world something about its future. His predictions are grim. Da Vinci writes of entire forests being destroyed and weapons of mass destruction. He refers to the extinction of species and the slaughter of man. One of his most recurring themes is destruction by water, flood, or tidal wave. For centuries, da Vinci scholars have scanned every inch of page 1033, trying to make sense of the prophecy and trying to figure out what the missing piece is. So the idea that this drawing may not only be a da Vinci, but the missing piece and part of the prophecy is huge. Add to that, that a cardinal considered something about this drawing so important that he felt it needed to be carefully hidden, and I want to know what was history's greatest mind trying to tell us. A newly discovered Leonardo da Vinci drawing was reportedly found hidden in the binding of a book. Now it's been revealed that the book belonged to a Catholic cardinal tasked with stomping out religious revolutions, and the image may be from a section of da Vinci's work that foretells the end of the earth. So why did a church cardinal keep da Vinci's work hidden for all these years, possibly going so far as to erase his signature? Were they attempting to suppress da Vinci's prophecies or da Vinci himself? When you first saw this sketch, yeah. what did you think? My first impression, extraordinary drawing. And I said, for me, the drawing is about 1500, slightly after. And this is interesting. When Dr. Hohenstadt first saw the picture, the artistic technique was so advanced, he thought it had to be from 1500. However, when scientists tested the paper, they learned that it was actually from 1475. So who could have been doing work 25 years ahead of his peers? You got it, Leonardo da Vinci. I can clearly state that for me, it's a Leonardo da Vinci. Yes. For you it is. <laughs> yes. There's enough evidence. Yeah, for me it's enough evidence. How much would it be worth? Uh, Throw a number out there. Let's say 50 million. <laughs> Wow. Dude. You were close to $50 oh million. Yeah. Whoever took this image could have taken the entire Codex Atlanticus. Why this particular sketch? Um, it, it's very difficult to answer to this question because uh, we don't know it really. Could it be connected in any way to the fact that it was surrounded by prophecies? With this, yes. He was naturally also thinking about the future because he was a researcher. The prophecies was another way looking at reality to open up, uh, let's say, considerations which normally uh, people wouldn't have. And he made also some of them about the church, which at the end are critics also on the church. Hey, Brad. So I hear you saw the picture in question. So was it the real deal? What do you think? What's compelling to me is they have scientific evidence. They have done their homework. This feels like, I mean, from everything we're seeing, it feels like it did come out of the Codex Atlanticus. 
So if we're confident that it's a Leonardo, to me, the next step is to figure out why the Cardinal will want to hide it. There's this idea that Leonardo da Vinci and other scientists were really pushing the boundaries, and the church didn't necessarily want that to happen. Listen, da Vinci was a genius, but a controversial one. In an age when Europeans were put to death for dissecting cadavers, da Vinci is the guy who secretly performed more than 30 human dissections. And we also know that da Vinci had an alternative lifestyle. He was arrested for an incident with a male prostitute. And yes, I'm sure these facts didn't sit well with the church, but it may be something in the work itself that troubled its leaders. Da Vinci hid meanings and symbols throughout his art. If we can find the theme, it might help us figure out what he was trying to tell us and what the church was trying to cover up. Yeah, and what freaks me out about that avenue is that if the church knows that there's a prophecy here and the prophecy is so frightening and scary and devastating that they just don't want it out there. Father, were there aspects of da Vinci's uh, revolutionary thinking that the church may have wanted to suppress? Well, his, his private life and his um, homosexuality, but the church uh, doesn't uh, commend everything in his lifestyle or it's not um, giving blanket approval to everything, but in general, it recognized that he was a, as a very great and important figure. The church was fairly prudent about um, not inquiring too much into people's lifestyle, yeah. providing they kept it reasonably discreet. Is it discreet to be um, doing experiments on human bodies in the back room? Well, there was a strong tradition of, of medicine throughout the Middle Ages. Uh, many of the universities had a medical faculty, but the church never uh, forbade, um, indeed encouraged, it encouraged um, looking after one's body and taking proper measures where necessary. So um, in that, uh, Leonardo was very much encouraged. Da Vinci was fascinated with the human anatomy. Using only the crude instruments of his day, Da Vinci dissected and drew the different parts of the brain. He made major breakthroughs in our understandings of the backbone. And in 2005, Francis Wells developed a revolutionary technology to repair damaged hearts that was based on Da Vinci's diagrams from 500 years ago. We're interested in a sketch found among the belongings of the Cardinal Tadini. Yes. Uh, the thing about this sketch is that it appears to be a self-portrait, potentially, that has hidden meaning, hidden symbols, mirrored writing that says something. All throughout the medieval period, there was a lot of interest in the occult and prophecy and so on. So that was quite uh, standard. And they also liked uh, writing in secret language and so on. So that was um, uh, part of life. Another Renaissance artist who was thought to use secret language was Michelangelo. It's reported that the Sistine Chapel contains coded messages consisting of Hebrew letters and Old Testament symbiology. Like Leonardo, Michelangelo may have been hiding ideas that would have got him in trouble with the church. Some say the Sistine Chapel contains hidden attacks on the corrupt Pope Julius II, the same man who commissioned Michelangelo to paint the Sistine Chapel, which is an awesome way to say, screw you. Father, I'm intrigued that the sketch may have contained hidden messages that were meant for the future. Yes, well, it's possible. Um, they rather like this kind of playful hiding um, and a certain amount of secrecy within paintings, yes. We find that in many other painters. So that was common to do? Uh, yes, that's right, that's right. What, why would he be hiding um, details of what he thought was going to happen at the end of the world? Well, there was a general interest in what would happen at the end of the world. And the end of the world is something to be feared because we're, we're sinners, but welcomed because we're chosen by God, which uh, for Leonardo, it was essential. So you think the Catholic Church um, was not trying to, to hide anything of da Vinci's, but was actually um, sort of owning him and... and... Embracing him. Yes, uh, basically, Leonardo's had full support from the, from the church and he's been recognized as a, as a very great figure. And of course, that doesn't mean to say that the church approved of everything he did or wrote, etc., etc. but basically, Leonardo and his uh, way of life and all that he tried to do, the church has um, given great encouragement. 
Today, the church's official stance is they take no issue with da Vinci's work. They see him as a complex man with some far out ideas and an ironic sense of humor. And we also know that Leonardo embedded messages in much of what he did. So why would he place a self-portrait among his most cryptic prophecies? We need to find out more about Leonardo's other works, especially the one famously debated as another possible self-portrait, the Mona Lisa. We're looking into the prophecies of da Vinci, and it seems that a newly discovered Leonardo sketch could be the clue to understanding what he was trying to tell us from beyond the grave. We just learned that hiding messages inside works of art was popular during the Renaissance, and da Vinci was the master of it. Buddy Mac and Scott are talking to someone who can shed light on the Codex Atlanticus, the collection that contained da Vinci's prophecies, as well as da Vinci's most famous work of all. The Codex Atlanticus is a fantastic collection. A number of pages have been said to have been found, yes, and I know that there are art historians who are authenticating pages and trying to understand whether they belong and where they belong. We heard that the Codex Atlanticus also contains some prophecies that Leonardo made. Um, there were considerations about how one should behave and how one should expect things to be. They're kind of um, ways of uh, deep, deep thought using very clever wording. Leonardo thought a lot about the future, and we know he was obsessed with water. When he died, he was preparing what many believe would have been his last masterpiece. It was called The Great Flood. The sketches show a storm so violent it topples mountains. As the few survivors cling to rafts, an old man sits on a rock, sadly observing the suffering, but unable to help. It is believed that the old man is Leonardo himself, yet another mysterious self-portrait. This may be a wild thought, but could it be possible that these unusual, unorthodox self-portraits are all part of a series, one that leads us back to page 1033 of the Codex Atlanticus and actually explains the prophecies. When he describes the flood and the deluge with the incredible words, um, it's very descriptive and it's very evocative. And the drawings are very detailed and they're very specific drawings looking at the destruction that such a natural event could bring. So he was pointing to the fact that these are the things that are human nature is uh, going to be subjected to during our lifetime. If you want to extend that to the lifetime of all the ones who come after us, certainly you can say that that is a warning to ourselves as part of nature. Listening to Marina Wallace describe da Vinci's views on nature, I started to think he was speaking to future generations more than his own. I think Leonardo was really absorbed in what he did. He was very, very, very busy. He had commissions, he started paintings, he didn't finish them, he went on to something else, traveled. Remember that traveling took a long time. He took the Mona Lisa with him wherever he went, and he left work unfinished all the time. You said he took the Mona Lisa with him wherever he went? It, it, we know that the Mona Lisa traveled with him. It's one of the paintings that traveled uh, that he liked to have with him. Okay, if you tell me that da Vinci hand carried the Mona Lisa with him everywhere, I wanna know why. Was he protecting something bigger than the painting itself? The Mona Lisa features a seated woman with a subtle smile. This seemingly simple image is possibly the most widely recognized and studied piece of art in the history of the world. It's estimated to be worth more than $700 million. But could there be more to this painting than meets the eye? This isn't a novel. Could the Mona Lisa be the key to crack a code that spans da Vinci's life's work? There's water in the background of the Mona Lisa, isn't there? That's right, yes. Because there's lower water on one side and higher water on the other. There are different kinds of landscapes and there is a figure in the middle so that, that they, they don't combine completely if you remove the figure. If you remove the figure, there would be a deluge of water one side or the other. The background of the Mona Lisa looks like a beautiful nature scene, but look closer. The water is clearly higher on one side than the other, as though a flood is inevitable. And here's the thing, if you pull the Mona Lisa out of the painting, the waters come crashing together. The only thing stopping the flood is the alleged self-portrait. 
So again, we have to ask, could the Mona Lisa be part of a larger story, Leonardo's story of the end of the world? He was trying really hard to put across feelings and emotions and expressions as in a human being as well as in nature. And that's why he was interested in this extraordinary phenomena of uh, floods and deluges and uh, things that in which nature expressed itself in such an expressive way. Clearly, we need to look deeper into the Mona Lisa, the painting that never left Leonardo's side. Who was Mona Lisa and what was so special about that particular painting? Answering these questions could be the key to unlocking da Vinci's final prophecy. For one year, uh, Leonardo lived there and exactly in that building. Da Vinci lived right there? Yes, for one, one and a half year, from 1500 to 1501. Who do you think the Mona Lisa was? I believe that Mona Lisa is Lisa Gherardini. The relationship is between Francesco del Giocondo, Lisa's husband, and Ser Piero, the father of Leonardo. Giuseppe's English is a lot better than my Italian, but let me translate. He was able to trace Lisa Gerardini's husband to Leonardo da Vinci's father. So Giuseppe believes when Francesco del Giocondo wanted something to hang on his mantle, he commissioned his friend's kid to paint a portrait of his wife. Little did he know, he was hiring one of the most talented men in history to turn his wife into one of the most immortal images of all time. I want to go see where Lisa Gerardini is buried. You have to meet uh, Silvano Vincetti and his team because they are uh, investigating uh, under the old church where probably Lisa was buried. Right here in Florence? Is exactly. <laughs> Giuseppe's theory is plausible, but unproven. But you know what we got access to? The dig site where they're now exhuming the bones of Lisa Gerardini with the hope of making a positive identification. Hello. Hello. Hello, Scott. Welcome, and now we'll take a great tour of the digs that we're exploring. Okay, that sounds exciting. The excavation dig began here, where in the church was located the altar. They used a machine so they knew exactly where they should dig for the graves. They referred to a book by the Franciscan monk that wrote about them bringing four bodies to this crypt in the 1600s, and they believed that Lisa Gerardini's body was brought here from that book. They kept digging, and in fact, they found a skull. If we find the bones, we can reconstruct the face, and it has very, very little room for air. And this is something anthropologists can do, but art historians cannot. So what will Silvano Vincetti do with the remains? Through DNA extraction and facial reconstruction, scientists can make a positive identification of the deceased. Vincetti has successfully employed this controversial technique before, and if it works, it could prove whether the Mona Lisa is in fact Lisa Gerardini or another of da Vinci's self-portraits. But this is the hard part of being on the cutting edge of an investigation. Until they literally dig a little deeper, the last page of this part of the story will remain unwritten. If you knew 100% that the bones of Lisa Gerardini were here, what would that tell us about the painting the Mona Lisa and about Leonardo da Vinci? Leonardo. Leonardo wrote in many painting books that you have to express the model and in symbols within the painting, and he used that. Leonardo always thought the eyes express the person's soul the best, and so maybe he was sending us a message to say, look very closely. So have you found any symbols hidden in the Mona Lisa? What I found was in the left eye, there is the letter S. In the right eye, there's a letter L. Then in the background of the painting, underneath the arch, there's the number 72. 
During this period of the Renaissance, geometric symbols and numbers were very important. When you're investigating signs and symbols, the numbers seven and two come up time and time again. I hide the number 27 in every single one of my novels. And they were clearly special numbers to Leonardo. Da Vinci used 27 and 72 degrees as the basis for Vitruvian Man. The numbers show up repeatedly in his paintings, and he even invented his own shape that has 72 sides. When I found the number 72, I thought of The Last Supper, because in the painting, the ceiling has 72 inlays. Seven and two also refers to John's gospel talking about the apocalypse. Clearly, da Vinci was fixated on two and seven. Silvano says 27 refers to the book of Revelations, in which Jesus tells Apostle John about a violent series of events at the end of the world. 72 is also a biblical reference. It refers to the number of races that survived Noah's Ark. That's right. The number 72 doesn't just relate to an apocalyptic story, but to a story describing a worldwide flood. Leonardo knew very well the Old and New Testament of the Bible. And in his library, personal library, he had these passages written out. So if we do look very closely at the Mona Lisa, do you think he's um, telling us something that's going to happen? Leonardo, lo ripeto. Leonardo da Vinci used to say that the painting is the appearance that dresses the truth. If you look in the background of the painting, you'll see that the landscape is unfinished. Meanwhile, Mona Lisa is very clear, and it's saying that men have the power to destroy nature, so be careful. The genius of Leonardo is that he was able to put all that he learned inside his paintings and put messages in there that speak to us over the ages. Silvano still has several tests to run before he can prove if Lisa Gerardini was or was not the Mona Lisa but we've learned some invaluable information about the Mona Lisa itself. Maybe the key to the Mona Lisa isn't who she is, but that her canvas carries the number 72. Da Vinci uses 72 in his work almost as often as he uses the theme of water and floods. And we just learned that 72 may in fact be a direct reference to a biblical flood. Da Vinci's message may be starting to come together. Buddy Mac and Scott are decoding Da Vinci's prophecies from the Codex Atlanticus, the collection of Da Vinci's sketches and ideas compiled after his death. They've been scouring his work for clues, and there's evidence that Da Vinci's use of the number 72 in his work may be a reference to a flood of biblical proportions. Da Vinci was centuries ahead of his time in many of his engineering and scientific feats. He predicted the tank, the submarine, driving devices. If he prophesized a great flood, this is the guy I'm gonna listen to. So why was Da Vinci obsessed with water and what exactly was he predicting? In his work, I see a lot of water, you know, flowing water and different levels of water behind the Mona Lisa. Why his obsession with water? Water, while uh, a very positive element in nature, one that allowed you to grow things that was a means of communication and transportation, could also be extremely violent. Leonardo not only made many drawings of water and included the representation of water and aqueous bodies in many of his paintings, but he also uh, wrote about water in the Codex Atlanticus itself. And we were talking about flooding, the dangers of flooding and how conscious Leonardo would have been of that. One of the things that he wrote in the Codex Atlanticus was, the swollen rivers overflow and submerge the wide lowlands and its inhabitants. This sounds like some great mystery, some great apocalyptic happening. It does. That Leonardo is foretelling. Another thing that Leonardo told us from, writes to us in the Codex Atlanticus is that seawater will rise above the high peaks of mountains towards the sky and will fall down again towards the mountain of men. This also sounds really mysterious, doesn't it? It sounds like Leonardo's telling us something, he's predicting the future. But we don't necessarily have to read this this way. Leonardo could just be talking about the kinds of things that he would have witnessed any time a river overflowed. It happened frequently, whole villages were swept away, 
by the natural course of water through the landscape. Why didn't he write that in past tense then? You know, the, the, instead of rises or will rise, why didn't he say they rose? Because time and nature were thought of as cycles, ah. the logical conclusion to knowing that this had been the case in the past would have been to assume that that state would return again at some point in the future. Leonardo understood the best way to see into the future is to understand your past. Where most people saw chaos, he saw rhythms and patterns and cycles. It's possible da Vinci's prophecies drew on his observations of natural disasters to predict future catastrophes, something we've been spectacularly bad at in the past decade and even in the last year. We know da Vinci's work from five centuries ago has helped us make breakthroughs today. If da Vinci had a method for predicting disasters, we need to find out what he foresaw. What do, you, what do you think? Do you think the Codex Atlanticus is, has any of these prophecies that we've been hearing about? A 72 keeps coming up, and I do believe that this is a time that people did bury sort of symbols and messages in artwork. I mean, that wasn't, it wasn't uncommon at the time. We know that da Vinci was well aware of riddles, of mirror writing, right. of embedding um, sort of mysteries within the context of the painting. What else could he be hiding in there intentionally? How about the, the, the missing sketch that we saw from the Codex Atlanticus? Do you think that the, the Catholic Church, through the Cardinal, was hiding it for some reason? And what reason do you think that might be? I think the Catholic Church was really impressed with him and knows that he has a huge fan base. And so if there's anything he's saying that doesn't support them or help them, of course they're gonna, of course they're gonna rip out the pages and repress it. Now, I don't know that's what happened, but I could absolutely see that happening. Oh, look. Oh, yes! Oh, so do you think uh, da Vinci prophesized fireworks? One of his prophecies from the Codex Atlanticus reads like this. It shall seem to men that they see new destructions in the sky, and the flames descending therefrom shall seem to have taken night. Wow. It does seem like a prophecy, doesn't it? It's right there. Buddy, Mac, and Scott have been all over Italy deciphering da Vinci's prophecies. Many of his writings seem to be apocalyptic, and we learned he had an obsession with water, tidal waves, and floods. But here's the key question. Was da Vinci predicting a specific event we can prepare for, or was he simply observing the cycles of nature? Ciao, I appreciate it. We've been looking at to Leonardo as a visionary and really someone who may have written prophecies. Do you believe that some of his writings were actually prophecies? The answer I would have is an example of the Dome of Florence. If you were asking us for 1296 when we began the construction, we we're going to build an impossible church like that, an impossible dome. Only few had the dream to be the inventors of that. And uh, Michelangelo, Botticelli, Vespucci were dreamers. And so Leonardo was one of these dreamers. When work on the Florence Cathedral began in 1296, the architects had no idea how to build a church of that size, but they were confident that future generations would rise to the occasion. The finishing touches weren't put on it until 173 years later, when a young apprentice of Verrocchio's named Leonardo is said to have worked on the design of a brass ball to sit atop the dome. This was how da Vinci thought. Someone had a dream of starting the world's most magnificent cathedral, and two centuries later, he's using all the advancements in art, architecture, and engineering to complete it. Just as his dreams of an underwater apparatus and flying machines would be realized through the scientific advancements of generations after him. So maybe visionary, yes, prophet, no? I would say visionary, yes, or that if you ask me if he was able to predict that was going to happen a certain disaster on a certain day. No. He was a scientist. He was trying to comprehend, to give a 
in order with these things. Maybe that's why we're drawn to him so much, is he really believed human beings could do it, that human beings could synthesize everything we know. But uh, like all the geniuses we had, Oppenheimer, Einstein, and uh, the others were not thinking to destroy the world. They were thinking us to give us something new, better for our future. So it depends how you use the things you have. Leonardo believed in our ability to further his ideas. But which ideas? Would we pursue his innovations in medicine and engineering that improved health and quality of life? Or would we take his designs for weapons and war machines? Did da Vinci prophesize a future in which we used his ideas to improve the world or to destroy it? Buddy McKinley and Scott have their own conclusions. You guys probably don't believe that this is my first full-on gelato since we've been here. Really? I don't believe that. Well, I was waiting till we got to the end, to Milan. All roads have led us to Milan, and I wanted to end on it. What better place to try to conclude this? Do you guys think that Leonardo da Vinci is trying to speak to us from beyond the grave? Hell yeah. I would say that he's not trying to speak to us from beyond the grave, but he definitely is. His message in general was learn, get knowledge, find out as much as you can. Right. You, you can never know enough. And more importantly, though, I do think, and he was not prophesizing the end of the world or some sort of Armageddon, but just letting us know lots of things he saw that we were doing right. that were going to harm our natural surroundings. I think he's just a guy that was so far ahead of his time, so brilliant and synthesizing so much information from so many directions, mm -hmm. and he got so much right that he does start to look prophetic. When he starts to talk about deforestation, it's because he, he understood that with the human mind, you can quickly learn how not just to chop down one tree, but chop down a hundred trees in a day. He foresaw a time when human beings and their technology would begin to have a devastating effect on the natural world. Whereas before, right. the natural world did its own thing and, and humans couldn't really control it. I mean, he was trying to, right, with irrigation right. and changing the flow of water. But he was able to see that, wait a minute, if there are enough of us, we're gonna start yeah. to have an effect. And that's hundreds of years before it's time. As you know, like in American literature, they don't start to talk about that till 1950s or something. A I mean, they, like, it's not even a discussion. It's it's always like, how can we overcome nature? How can we overcome our human yeah. nature? And he understood that these aren't things to overcome. These are things to live in sync with. Maybe that's what he's saying to us: is be humanists. Yes. You know, um, realize the human potential and live your own human potential. I really can't help but looking at his environmental observations as sort of the most important thing that he's left us in a lot of ways and and a responsibility too and that responsibility is you know don't deplete all of your natural resources um, you know don't create technology that can kill one another and so yeah I mean I think that we've got a guy who is speaking to us from beyond the grave and speaking to us maybe for all time can we dump these things? yes uh -huh. Laws of thermodynamics right here. You have a little Maxwell's demon in a cup. Looks like melted ice cream to me. Da Vinci would totally get my jokes if he were around. You guys don't. <laughs> what sent us down this path was a newfound portrait by Leonardo da Vinci that came from his book of prophecies. So what did the portrait mean? Was it a hint, a clue, a prophecy in itself? It was. Because it is da Vinci himself who's the answer. It's da Vinci himself who is absolute proof of the world's most beautiful secret, that the future is created by us, by human innovation. So what will the future bring? It depends how big we're willing to dream. Almost 500 years ago, every single one of da Vinci's inventions failed. The wings didn't help him fly. The scuba gear was made from a suit of leather. His pre-helicopter never took off, but over time, as human innovation caught up with his ideas, they all worked. It is his ultimate prophecy. Be daring, be daring, always be daring. There is no big dream unless you dream big.